Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about J.M. Coetzee's novel, Foe. Now, this is one of the best postmodern novels, in my personal opinion. Um, I, this is a fantastic novel, and it does a number of really, really central postmodern things. Without, and, and one of the things that I like about it, as opposed to some other postmodern novels, is that this is not an especially weird for weird sake or like challenging type novel. It's a it's a it's an easy and straightforward novel for the most part. Um, in that you can follow along very clearly with what it's doing, but it's still exploring these postmodern themes and ideas and concerns. So basically, uh, Foe is told, it's a first person novel told from the perspective of Susan Barton, who is a female castaway on the island of Robinson Crusoe from the Daniel Defoe uh, novel. She is not a character in Defoe's novel. If you've read uh, Robinson Crusoe, it's Crusoe and Fry who are on the island. In this version, there's Crusoe, Friday, and Barton. So Coetzee has invented this character of Susan Barton. And this is inter this is a um, a variation on what the scholar Jeremy Rawson calls minor character elaboration, which is uh, the kind of thing we get in something like Gene Reese's White Sargasso Sea or Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead works like this, where you take a minor character from a piece of canonical literature and you build a story around their experience or you, uh, ex you attempt to express what their voice might sound like, etc., etc., Koetsi is doing a variation on that because he's he's building a character who doesn't exist in the canonical original uh, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Um, but Koetsi is imagining what it would be like if this character did exist. So again, that's a that's a postmodern approach. This idea of building up a minor character and, and making them the central figure in their own story. Though there are variations on this that go back before postmodernism, this is a genre that really sort of exploded in the 70s and the 80s. Um, John Gardner's Grendel is another example. So that's one core component here. Um, so Susan Barton uh, washes up. Uh, she's She's been um, set adrift with the dead captain of a ship that she was on after a mutiny. Um, she washes up, she, she swims uh, from the, the boat, washes up on Crusoe's island. Uh, she spends about a year there and then they're rescued. Crusoe dies on the way back and Friday, uh, who's had his tongue cut out. And so unlike Defoe's Friday, who learns speech and is able to hold these like long discourses with Crusoe. Uh, this Friday understands a small number of commands, things like wood and dig, um, but he doesn't speak and he doesn't seem to have much in the way of self-expression apart from being able to play one tune on a flute. So Friday ends up sort of hooked to Susan Barton. And Barton, is Barton, when they come back to England, is trying to get Daniel Foe, before he became Dafoe, to sound more French and fancy. Uh, she's trying to get Daniel Foe to write the story of the island, but she wants it to be written truthfully, and she wants him to express the real experience of what went on. And so most of the novel is actually about writing, about the, the ways in which writing functions, the challenges of writing, um, 
the difficulties of expressing truth, etc., etc. And the thing is, it's so much about that. That's the that's the overwhelming theme of the novel, to such an extent that I don't know how well this is going to show up here, but all of these pages that I've folded over. Those are sections mostly about the challenges of writing and of expressing truth through writing. And those are just the ones that really jumped out at me as particularly interesting. Virtually every page has some sort of mediation on writing, memory, expression, truth, etc., etc. And so this extremely self-conscious approach to writing, this is another deeply postmodern thing. That that you have fiction that's not about the subject matter so much as it is about the act of creating fiction or what it means to create fiction or to be fictional, etc., etc. So that's really, really central here. And then the other postmodern component that we've got that's that's um, key to this novel is the sort of explorations of different philosophical conceptions, not just about writing, but um, various kinds of philosophy. And I'll, I'll, I'll one that really strikes me is, and this actually is connected to the idea of storytelling, but it's, it draws on Roland Barthes' idea of the zero signifier. And that becomes really central to this novel as well, particularly because Friday has no tongue. He has no... He, he learns to write a few letters by the end, but he doesn't write words. And so Friday is this sort of silent mystery that increasingly becomes at the core of the of both Barton's narrative in Foe and of what Daniel Foe in the novel is really interested in. Um, so at one point at one point um, Barton reflects as well as the story of Friday, which is properly not a story, but a puzzle or hole in the narrative. I picture it as a buttonhole, carefully cross-stitched around, but empty, await waiting for the button. So this is the zero signifier. This is... In Barth's philosophy, the zero signifier, and this, is, this goes back to semiotics, which is properly a structuralist discipline and not postmodern or post-structuralist, um, Barth's zero signifier is basically the element that signifies, the element that creates meaning by its absence. So the fact that it's not there is what makes it meaningful. And Foe comes to this idea as well, um, because later in the, the novel he says, in every story there is a silence, some sight concealed, some word unspoken, I believe. Till we have spoken the unspoken, we have not come to the heart of the story. So, this idea that Friday and Friday's experience is this zero signifier, is the, the thing that would give the story meaning is a really interesting idea in part because Friday is so thoroughly mysterious not only to Barton and Foe but to us as readers like we all we all that we have to go on about Friday's inner life to the extent that he has one and we and we don't know how much he does all that we have to go on is what Barton is able to determine and she's never able to determine anything with certainty. And this is part of the thing about Friday that's so fascinating about this character. Barton recognizes repeatedly that his story is malleable because it's imposed by others. 
So for instance, she says here, Friday has no command of words and therefore no defense against being reshaped day by day in conformity with the desires of others. I say he is a cannibal and he becomes a cannibal. I say he is a laundryman and he becomes a laundryman. What is the truth of Friday? You will respond he is neither cannibal nor laundryman. These are mere names. They do not touch his essence. He is a substantial body. He is himself. Friday is Friday. But that is not so. No matter what he is to himself, is he anything to himself? How can he tell us? What he is to the world is what I make of him. Therefore, the silence of Friday is a, hope, is a helpless silence. He is the child of his silence, a child unborn, a child waiting to be born that cannot be born. So this is where, this is where some of the stakes are set um, in terms of the importance of storytelling, the importance of writing and of fiction. Um, because one of the ideas of postmodern philosophy is that the world is created through narrative. Things, truth, the world only exists to the extent that there are stories that help us make sense of it. And who gets to tell those stories what the role, the cultural role of those stories is, is very much fraught in, po in the postmodern world. And we get that in this novel, not only with Friday, but with Barton's concerns about how she's going to be depicted uh, in Foe's novel. And she says at one point to him, toward the end of the novel, I am not a story, Mr. Foe. I may impress you as a story because I began my account of myself without preamble, slipping overboard into the water and striking out for the shore. But my life did not begin in the waves. There was a life before the water which stretched back to my desolate searchings in Brazil, thence to the years with my, when my daughter was still with me, and, and so on back to the day I was born, all of which makes up a story I do not choose to tell. I choose not to tell it because to no one, not even to you, do I owe proof that I am a substantial being with a substantial history in the world. I choose rather to tell of the island, of myself and Crusoe and Friday and what we three did there, for I am a free woman who asserts her freedom by telling her story according to her own desire. And so, I mean, we've got, that, so this brings us both to this idea of the sort of postmodern power of storytelling and what it means to be in command of a story. But it also takes us to the feminist element of this novel, which of course is that um, Barton is elided. She's erased from what we know to be the novel Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. And so that element, that element of erasure is really what's at the core of minor character elaboration a lot of the times, especially with things like Grendel or White Sargasso Sea. It's about exploring the perspectives of characters whose perspectives have been deemed in some way illegitimate in their canonical works, often because of gender, race, or social class. And so in this case, we have that as well. But again, amplified slightly because Susan Barton is not a character in the original. Well, one of the other things that's important here in terms of the way that Faux deals with storytelling is that the stories are complicated. It's not simply a question of chronicling objectively what occurred on the island. Storytelling is treacherous. Writing is treacherous. Um, so we get, for instance, this bit. Um, this is in the the second portion, or debatably the third portion of the novel, um, in which Susan and Friday are staying in Crusoe, or are staying in Foe's home. Foe's had to flee because of his debts, uh, so he doesn't get arrested, and they're sort of squatting in his home. And Susan Barton is writing 
she's using his papers and things to write, to try and write her own story. And one of the things she says here is, Alas, my stories always seem to have more applications than I intend, so that I must go back and laboriously extract the right application and apologize for the wrong ones and efface them. Some people are born storytellers. I, it would seem, am not. And so this actually suggests um, deconstruction. Uh, deconstructionism by Jacques Derrida, which is another postmodern philosophy. The idea basically of deconstruction is that whenever we use language, we always express more than we intend to express. We always, our, our words and language is always carries depths of meaning that we as speakers or writers do not intend. And this is a sort of central idea of postmodernism with the, the fascination with writing, the fascination with what it means to write, what it means to create fiction, etc., etc. Um, and and so again, this is another sort of philosophical component of the novel tied into these fundamental themes of writing and expression. Now, I had said earlier that for the most part, this is easy and straightforward to read. This is a fairly literal novel, um, especially by postmodern standards. The caveat to that is that section four, which is the last five pages, four and a half pages, becomes very surrealist. It becomes a kind of dream sequence. And because it's the end of the novel, it's not really clear how it relates to what's come before. Um, we assume, I, or I assume at least, that this is still told from the first person perspective of Susan Barton, because it, I mean, it is first person. Um, the second sentence is, on the landing I stumble over a body. So there is still that first person I perspective. But it becomes this weird dream sequence, kind of macabre um, experience where the speaker is encountering dead bodies uh, of, of people we've met throughout the rest of the novel um, portions of it seem to be in maybe foe's house portions of it seem to be in the shipwreck from that that stranded crusoe and friday um and it's just it's a very bizarre bit but what makes it more bizarre is that nothing follows up from it so it's simply this strange dream type sequence that ends the novel. And because there's no follow up that sort of says, here's how to make sense of this in the context of the novel as a whole, it sort of stands as this bizarre exclamation mark at the end of the novel. And again, there are a lot of very, very bizarre, weird for weird sake type postmodern novels. And Koetsi has given us about five pages of that in what's otherwise a pretty linear, straightforward type novel.